Good morning. 40 years, uh, that's a long time. Um, I remember when I was four years old in the Lord, and I thought I was an older Christian. And now uh, 40 years of being in this church has been tremendous. Uh, let me just um, frame the idea of 40 for you. Um, some interesting facts about the number 40. The word 40, F-O-R-T-Y, is the only uh, number in English whose letters are in alphabetical order, F-O-R-T-Y. Minus 40 degrees, that is 40 below zero, is the only temperature that is exactly the same whether it's in Fahrenheit or in centigrade. Uh, when the bubonic plague hit Europe, and ships were coming into port. They were kept out at sea for 40 days before anybody could disembark. And when that happened in Italy, in Venice, Italy, uh, the word in Italian is quaranta, and that's where we get the name quarantine from, from them having to stay in port for 40 days. 40 is also the maximum number of players that a Major League Baseball team can sign to its roster at once. The typical length of human pregnancy lasts 40 weeks. The typical American work week is also 40 hours. And uh, it took chemists 40 attempts to develop this spray, <laughs> WD-40. They just sort of stuck with that idea took them 40 attempts, so WD-40 just means water displacement, 40th formula. So after number 40, they got it right. 40 in the Bible is pretty important. You know, 40 days is the time span that Jesus spent fasting in the wilderness. The flood lasted 40 days and 40 nights. Jonah went to Nineveh and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And the Jewish people wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. 40 years they wandered in the wilderness. I've been wandering in the wilderness of New Mexico for 40 years. They've been the best years of my life. So Lenny and I moved here to New Mexico from Southern California. Uh, we had a blue Datsun pickup truck. I love to tell the story because they don't even make dots and pickup trucks anymore. And um, it, it leaked oil all the way, so I had to put a quart of oil in every 100 miles or so just to get it here. It was like the Beverly Hillbillies, I say, in reverse. Um, and uh, we, we came here wondering about our future, so we started a little Bible study down the road at the Lakes Apartments on a Thursday night, Gospel of John, chapter by chapter. And uh, then from there, we started our first Sunday morning at a local movie theater, again, just right down the street. After the movie theater, we moved to, to Eubank, uh, 1660 Eubank, and then to Snow Heights Circle, and then eventually to this building. Forty years ago, there was no campus, per se. There was no radio station. There was no cafe. There was no... Solomon's porch, there was no staff, but there was a faithful God who made pretty incredible promises, and God through the years has built his church. Today, I want to look at a passage in 1 Peter chapter 2. So turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, because effectively Peter tells us how he does that, how he builds his church. And um, it's, it takes us back to the basics. First Peter was written to a group of struggling believers in that first century who were facing persecution. The Roman government was breathing down their necks. And Peter writes in part to have the believers discover the importance of the community called the church the importance of the unity that we share together as God's people in this new society. So he emphasizes the unity that we have with Christ and with each other, and he uses a metaphor to do that, a word picture. It's a picture of a house or a building going up. 
He sees a foundation stone that is laid, and then on top of the foundation stone are other stones, and next to it are other stones, and the building goes up. He is not talking about a physical structure. He's not talking about actual brick and mortar. He's talking about the spiritual reality of all of us together. So let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2. We'll begin in verse 1, go down to verse 8 to get the text and the context. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, all hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking... As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. Very, very simple terms that he is using, and I want to give you a very simple message about those terms. Let's talk about the building of this house. We are God's house. Let's look at three aspects of this building. Let's consider the foundation of the house, and then the framework of the house, and then finally the formation of the house, how it gets built. We begin with the foundation, like any builder would begin, the foundation of the house. And the foundation is the cornerstone. You'll notice that in the text we just read, four times Jesus is referred to as the cornerstone, actually five times. Uh, maybe even six, if you take the word rock as a synonym, but in four verses, that is mentioned. In verse four, coming to him as to a living stone. Down in verse six, behold, I lay in Zion a chief corner stone. Verse seven, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief corner stone. And then in verse eight, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. That's the foundation. That's the cornerstone, Christ. You know, it's funny, when people go to Israel, one of the, if they're a builder, if they're in the building trades, one of the things people notice is that all of the buildings, none of them are built out of like wood framed with stucco, like we have over here. There's no like wood slat houses or stucco homes or there's none of that framing construction. In Israel, by building code, everything has to be made out of stone. And in Jerusalem, local Jerusalem stone is part of the building code. So there's a lot of concrete. There's a lot of uh, stone block. Um, Certainly everything has a stone face, but in some cases, solid stone, which lasts a long time. That's why you can look archaeologically at at places in the Middle East, and they, they still exist. Well, in every ancient building, they began with a cornerstone. It was the first stone that was laid because it was the most important stone. It was always at the bottom. It was the foundation stone called the master course, that lower row of large ashlar stones. They were the largest and the heaviest. So get this, the cornerstone of of Herod's temple Now, Herod's temple isn't there, but the the temple mount foundations are. And the cornerstone of Herod's temple mount, the chief cornerstone is 39 feet, 4 inches long, by 7 feet, 10 inches wide, by 43 inches tall. The estimated weight is 80 tons, 80 tons, massive 
cornerstone. Now, the cornerstone was important because it maintained the symmetry of the building. The rest of the building would take its cues and set the directions by the cornerstone. So if the cornerstone was laid down slightly angled, the whole building would be rotated a bit on its axis. It would be out of kilt. If it was slightly slanted one direction or another, the higher you build, the building is going to be tilted. You risk collapse of the wall, inward or outward. So the point Peter is making is the most important stone, the, the stone that everything is laid on when it comes to the kingdom of God on earth, the church in this case on earth, is Jesus Christ. He is the cornerstone on which the church sets. Him personally. Not his example, not his words, him, his person, the person of Christ. So 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 says, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He's the foundation stone. He's the rock that the church is built on. This is important because... I grew up, maybe some of you grew up, hearing that Peter was the foundation stone because Jesus said, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. So the mistaken interpretation is that Jesus was building the future church on the person of Peter. The problem with that is Peter himself, who is writing this letter, tells us Jesus is the foundation, not him. So let's go back to that conversation. They were at Caesarea Philippi. Jesus asked his disciples a simple question, who do men say that I am? And then he said, who do you say that I am? And Peter was the guy who said, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, in effect, bingo, A plus on the test, Peter. You got the question right. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. He wasn't building the church on Peter. He was building the church on what Peter had just said about Jesus. He had just said about Jesus, you are the son of the living God. You are the Messiah. The church is built on the confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and he has built his church on that ever since. So if what, if what you believe about Jesus is set correctly, then the rest of your faith, the rest of your life is going to be aligned. If what you believe about Jesus is incorrect, the rest of your life is going to be a bit wonky and unstable and uneven, and even risk collapse. What you believe Jesus to be is essential. He is the rock that this church is built on. So he is called the stone. He is called the cornerstone. But notice in verse 4, he is called the living stone. Now just think about that term for a minute. Living stone. That's an oxymoron. That's two words that, when you put together, contradict each other. Living stone. Stones are inanimate. Stones aren't alive. We even say, it's as, it, it, stone cold dead, because stones don't live. It's an oxymoron, sort of like airplane food or government organization, <laughs> or Microsoft Works. I had to get that in. <laughs> stones are dead, but here Jesus is called a living stone, a stone that is alive. Back in the 1970s, in fact, it was 1975, uh, there was a fad out called Pet Rocks. And uh, this guy had this crazy idea because he heard his friends in a bar talk about their pets and how hard they were to take care of and clean up after. And so he thought, I'm going to make a pet that you don't have to groom, don't have to feed, pretty easy to keep. I'll just get a rock, put little eyes on it and a smiley face, and I'll sell it. He sold it for $4 a rock, and he made millions of dollars on it. And I was one of the idiots that had one. 
a pet rock on my desk. It even came with a 32-page manual on how to train and care for your pet rock. I kid you not. So there's little commands you can tell your pet rock and train your pet rock to do. Some of them are pretty easy, like sit <laughs> or stay. They'll do that all day long. It's when you try to get it to roll over that it will it'll need a little help from you. So that has absolutely nothing to do with this message other than the fact that Jesus here is called the living stone. Why is he called the living stone? Because he died and he rose again from the dead. The resurrection made him solid but alive. So that's a phrase of Peter, living stone. Paul, uh, Peter spoke of the living hope in chapter 1, verse 3. He spoke of the living word in chapter 1, verse 23, and now he speaks of the living stone. But he says of this stone, it is rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. He was rejected. He's the rejected one, but he happens to be the right one because he is the righteous one and he is the risen one. So that makes him the right one. He fulfills the prophecies of the Old Testament and he rose again from the dead. Question, why did they reject him? And they did reject him. He came unto his own his own received him not. He came to his own people. The Jewish people rejected him. Why? Because because he was not what they expected. What they expected was uh, a hero, um, a conqueror, a vanquisher, one who would overthrow the Roman bondage, the Roman yoke, and, and bring a new kingdom on earth immediately. That's the Messiah they longed for. They wanted a, a Superman Messiah, a, a Batman to take over Gotham and deliver it from all the evil people. Jesus came to die on a cross for sin, first and foremost, and then later to come back and rule and reign. So they rejected him, but the one they rejected has become the head of the corner, the chief cornerstone. There's an old rabbinical story in Judaism that says when they were building Solomon's temple, they didn't quarry the stones at the building site because they didn't want any sound to go on, so they quarried it miles away, made the stones, shipped them to the building site, and set them in place. The quarry had sent them the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone, among other stones to lay the master course, the lower row of stones. When the cornerstone came to the building site, the building supervisor didn't exactly know what it was, what to do with it. It seemed like an odd-shaped stone, so he had it pushed into a ravine and it laid at the bottom of a valley for months and months and months. More stones came. Everything was laid out. Finally, the building supervisor sent word to the quarry, where's the chief cornerstone? They said, we sent it to you months ago. And then one of the builders reminded the supervisor, hey, that was that stone we dumped over into the trash heap. And now it was filled. There was debris around it. There was grass growing up over it. So they had to kind of dig it out again and with great expense and time, move it back up the hill and set it into place. The stone for the temple was rejected and it happened to be the chief cornerstone. That is Christ. He is the foundation of the church, the foundation of the house. Let's look at the second segment. That is the framework of the house. And that's in verse 5. You also as living stones, there it is again, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So once the corner is laid out, once that big master course is set in place, other stones are set on top of it and set around it. And so he says, you also as living stones. It's one thing, verse 4, to come to a living stone. It's quite another thing to become a living stone. But that's the idea. Once you come, that's when you become. 
When you come to the living stone, you become a living stone. When you come to the author of life, you become alive. You become a living stone. When you come to Christ, you become a Christian. You become like Christ. Do you know what the word Christian means? It actually means a miniature Christ. It was a term the unbelieving world used in Antioch to describe believers in that city, and it was first used by them, but the slur, the word, meant originally a little Christ, a miniature Christ. So just keep that in mind next time you tell somebody, I'm a Christian, I'm a miniature Christ. You just might want to ask yourself, how well do I reflect that image, that title? So we are living stones. I've always loved the, the story of the king of Sparta. Sparta was a province in Greece. And the king of Sparta in ancient Sparta always boasted about the great walls of Sparta, the mighty walls of Sparta. So one time a visiting king was hanging out with him in Sparta, and the king said, you got to see the mighty walls of Sparta. The king looked around and goes, show me these walls. I don't see any walls. The king of Sparta pointed to his well-disciplined, well-trained troops and said, these men, they are the walls of Sparta. So just like the king was saying, my men are like bricks in the wall that form protection, so too the Bible says you and I are living stones. We share his life. We share his strength that exists in Christ. By the way, Christianity happens to be the only belief system in the world where the life of the one we worship becomes our life. Again, I want to say this, and I want you to mark it. Christianity is the only belief system in the world where the life of the one we worship becomes our life. You never hear a Buddhist say, I am in Buddha. You never hear... Um, a uh, worshiper or a, a, a believer in Confucius say, I am in Confucius, or somebody say, I am in Muhammad. But 87 times the New Testament says, we are in Christ. We share his life. We are actually in him. The one we worship, we share his life. So you are a living stone. You come to the living stone. You become a living stone. And, again, notice verse 5, you are built up a spiritual house. So he's talking about people. He's talking about us. Jesus sets the angle for us. He's the, he's the cornerstone. We're added stone upon stone. So church is all about people. You are the people of God. Hebrews 3, verse 6, Christ is a son over his own house, whose house we are. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9, you are God's building. So for the last 2,000 years, the enterprise that Jesus has been about on the earth is building his house, adding brick to brick to brick. If you ever go to San Jose, California, uh, there's a thing called the Winchester Mystery House. Just curious. Anybody here ever seen that? Winchester Mystery. Okay, so if you've been there, it's a crazy building. It, it's this huge, rambling, Victorian-style home. It was built by Sarah Winchester, hence the name Winchester Mystery House. So Sarah Winchester, was the, in the 1800s, was the heiress of the Winchester Rifle Company. And um, she was given $20 million dollars. Uh, for this uh, in her estate. She moved to California with 20, you know, $20 million is a lot of money. In the 1800s, it's a whole lot of money. She, she takes $20 million, goes to California, buys uh, a farmhouse, eight-room farmhouse, and a bunch of land. She is so haunted by the fact that Winchester rifles have killed people, she believed that the ghosts of all the people killed by her father and grandfather's rifles were going to haunt her. But somebody told her, some medium told her, the only way to get rid of that curse is you got to build continually and never stop building your house. 
So for the next, get this, 38 years, she built a house, and when she died, the home alone covered six acres, had six kitchens, 40 stairways, 160 rooms, and 10,000 windows. And it was never finished. If you ever go tour the house, it's like really wonky, weird, goes nowhere. 38 years of building, never really finished. God has been building his house for 2,000 years, still not done. Every time a person gets saved, he adds another brick. Every time a person comes to Christ, he adds another room, etc. Only his house looks a whole lot better than the Winchester Mystery House. We are a building. And then he says this, he adds this. A holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. Now, I like this. I think the house he's talking about, the building, he has in mind is the temple. Because that was called the house of the Lord. The house in Jerusalem was called the temple. The house. So he's thinking of the temple in Jerusalem, and he's thinking of the priesthood that attended that temple. But what he's saying is, you're it. You are the temple. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You don't have to go through a priest. You are the priest. Imagine the shock on my mother's face when I said, Mom, you've always, you've always dreamed that I'd become a priest. I want you to know I am. And she said, what? What do you mean you're a priest? That was always her dream, that I'd become a Catholic priest. And I told her, I'm a priest. I've, and I showed her this scripture. I'm a holy priesthood, and so are you. And I t- talked to her about the priesthood of the believer, but... Boy, was she shocked when I said that. So we have the foundation of the house and the framework of the house. Let's finish up with the formation of the house. How is the house built? How is the house built? How how do we grow? How do living stones stay alive? Or to use my little analogy, how does God feed his pet rocks? And the answer is Scripture. He does it through Scripture. Verse 6, Therefore, Peter says, Therefore, it is also contained in the Scripture. And now he quotes Isaiah chapter 28 from the Old Testament. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious. And he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. In verse 7, he quotes Psalm 118. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, here's the quote, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Then in verse 8, he quotes another scripture, this time Isaiah chapter 8, a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. What is Peter doing? He's quoting the Old Testament to show you that his idea that Christ is the cornerstone and we are the building is rooted in scripture. Peter is a good expositor. Peter preaches sermons like sermons should be preached. Too many sermons are my opinion, my feeling, you know, I want to say this or that. Peter says, this is what the Bible says. And he gives us the scripture. His belief is formed by the Bible. So the Bible predicts the reign of Messiah. The Bible predicts the coming kingdom of God. The Bible predicts the house that will be formed. But here's the problem. We have the plans. Question is, do we have the passion? We have the plans, but maybe we lack the passion. We have the plans on building a life, building a church right here in this book called the Bible. Those are the plans. Those are the blueprints. What about the desire, the passion? That's the problem. Go back to verse 1, which we have completely neglected up to this point, but everything sort of hinges on the first few verses. Therefore, laying aside all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and evil speaking, here it is, as newborn babes desire, desire the pure milk of, of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. The word desire means crave. It means yearn for. 
Babies crave milk. And they will let you know of their desire for milk. Am I right? Right? You'll hear them. They'll cry. They, they, they don't care what color the blanket is. You do. They don't care. They, they're, they're not offended if their pajamas aren't cool looking. They, they want food. They will crave milk, and they will let you know. They send clear messages for that. For a baby, milk is not a fringe benefit. It's an absolute necessity of life in order to grow. Let's apply that. Peter says, you are to desire, and it's an imperative, a command, desire pure spiritual milk that you may grow thereby. Our spiritual growth is directly, proportion, directly proportional to our desire. Our spiritual growth is directly proportional to our desire. The reason some people grow spiritually a lot is simple. They want to. They desire to. They crave Bible study. They crave spiritual food. Jesus said, and you finish this for me, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They will be filled. He didn't say blessed are those who casually snack on righteousness. Have a tidbit here and a tidbit there and a once a week meal, they hunger and thirst for righteousness. Those are the ones that will be filled. There was a guy who, uh, his name was Ollie. Ollie was a Lutheran. Ollie was the only Lutheran in a small Midwest town of Catholics. It's a Catholic town. My mom lived in such a town. And um, Ollie, the problem was that Ollie loved cooking steak on Friday. Well, during Lent, that was a real problem because everybody in town is eating fish on Fridays, and Ollie is on the back, in the backyard cooking steak. So the neighbors, it just drove them nuts. The aroma just killed them. So they finally all went over to Ollie's house smelling the steak because it smelled so good. They said, Ollie, look, uh, you're, you're, this is a town of Catholics if you haven't figured that out. You are the only Lutheran in this town. There is not a Lutheran church in this town. There's not even a Lutheran church for like miles. So our suggestion, strong suggestion, is that you convert and become a Catholic, and then we're all good. And they, he, they kind of just, you know, told him why it's a good thing to do it, and he thought about it, and he goes, yeah, I think you're right. I think I'll do I'll, I'm willing to do that. I'll convert. So they set it up, and the priest uh, came over and uh, the priest had Ollie kneel down, and he had holy water uh, next to him. And the priest said, Ollie, uh, you were born a Lutheran. You were raised a Lutheran. But now, and he sprinkled holy water on him, but now you're a Catholic. And everybody applauded him, hugged him, and it was all good. Now everybody in town's a Catholic. So Friday night rolls around, and once again, everybody smells the aroma of steak in Ollie's backyard. They go, oh my goodness, he's backslidden already. So they go over to Ollie's house, and as they're getting close to his house, they see him in the backyard, and he's holding up the steak, and he says to the steak, uh, you were born a beef, you were raised a beef, and he sprinkled some salt on it, now you're a fish. There's a man who craved meat. He, he yearned for it. He desired it. Wanted it more than anything else. Quick question for application. On a scale of 1 to 10, your desire for Scripture, what would you rate it as? Don't have to say it out loud. From 1 to 10, disinterest, mild interest, somewhat interested, or... I really crave it. I desire it. Because once again, spiritual growth is directly proportional to spiritual desire. What makes one student in school better than another student? Desire. What makes one worker at a business better than another worker? Desire. 
desire, the passion of a newborn, wanting pure milk, the pure milk of the word. Now, when you see that word milk, uh, it's not referring to elementary truths, basic truths, as opposed to meat, the meat of the word. I want to get into the meat of the word, man. I want to get into deep theological stuff, not the milk. He's not talking about that. It, the idea of pure milk means nothing is added to it. And think in terms of a baby wanting milk. The baby does not want 2%. The baby does not want skim milk. The baby wants pure milk, undiluted, not contaminated, so it won't starve, because the goal is to add weight. The goal is growth. So if you want to grow, desire pure spiritual milk. Don't add anything to this. Don't add your opinion to it. Don't add philosophy to it. Don't add psychology to it. Just truth, pure, undiluted truth. I'm going to put a picture in your mind. You're not going to like me for it. Picture in your mind an adult sitting in diapers with a binky and a rattle. <laughs> Horrible thought, isn't it? You go, that's so messed up. Um, applying that spiritually ask yourself, am I in the same position spiritually that I was five years ago, five months ago? Have I grown past that? Am I growing up? Am I becoming mature? Where, where do we begin? Where should we begin this process in the house of God, the brick and mortar of the people of God? Well, we begin by coming to Him. Look at verse 4. This is where we will close. Coming to him as to a living stone. Ask yourself this. Have you come to him? Have you come to Christ? This is how you enter the building plan. Sadly, not everyone aligns their life up with the cornerstone. The lines aren't right. They don't build their life right. They don't put their life on the stone, the rock, the foundation of Christ. Some accept him, but others reject him. That's the point of verse 7. So have you Come to him. Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. And then in verse 3, I said we, we would end in verse 4, but I'm going to take you back one verse. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, coming to him is to a living stone. The only way you're going to know the Christian experience is true or not is by experiencing it yourself. Tasting it. Tasting it. Not having somebody else eat the meal saying, it's pretty good. Okay, I'll take your word for it. No, you got to taste it yourself. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Jesus tastes better than sin. But you need to taste it. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Um, I grew up, my mom had pretty simple taste. She had four boys, so she would cook meals. She'd cook every night. She did a good job. A lot of times, uh, well, she was the one that introduced me to Hamburger Helper. I loved that whole concept when I was single. I, I, I took that cuisine with me because um, it was pretty easy. But we'd have Hamburger Helper or she'd do fish sticks, right? They're frozen. She'd thaw them out, stick them in the microwave. That's dinner. Um, pretty, pretty simple stuff. Pretty good stuff. Always a good meal. But then when I grew up, somebody took me out for a meal. And it was uh, steak and lobster. And I didn't even know that existed. <laughs> so when I had steak and lobster, I mean, this is a thing. This is, I, I could eat this like more than once in my life. This is amazing. So once you taste steak and lobster, you can do it. But it's just hard to go back to <laughs> fish sticks. <laughs> once you taste Jesus and the freedom he gives you, it's so good. It's so tasty. It's so liberating. You don't want anything else. Father, we want to thank you for letting us taste the sweetness, the wholeness, the salvation through Jesus, our Savior, our Lord. Thank you. We have tasted, and he is awesome. But I pray for some maybe who have never tasted. They've heard. They've heard others who have 
ordered it up and have partaken of the meal and they've tasted and they say it tastes pretty good, but they themselves have never partaken. They've never decided to let Jesus be in control of their lives. They've never surrendered to him. While many people come to church, not all have come to the living stone, come to Christ. And so, Lord, I pray that you would add another brick, bring another person, bring another man, bring another woman, another child, build your house, call more. Do it even now. Do it in our midst, we pray. If you're here this morning and you've never given your life to Christ, you've never surrendered to Him, you've never repented of your sin, you've never asked Him to take you as you are, in a sincere commitment of faith, if you have never done that, or if you have had some experience in the past, some spiritual inclination, but today you're not walking with Him, maybe you've wandered from Him, you've walked away from Him, and the Lord is calling you back home. Either way, if you are willing to surrender your life to Christ, our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. My eyes are open, so I'll notice you. But I want you to raise your hand up in the air if you're willing to say yes to Jesus this morning. Just raise it up, and I'll acknowledge you, and we'll pray, and we'll, we'll close. God bless you in the back on my left. Anybody else? Raise that hand up high so I can see it. Place it up. Anyone else? Not enough to just come to church. Come to Him. Come to Him. Surrender your life to an alien will, His will, His person, the Lord Jesus Christ. Anyone else? God bless you. Father, for these few, we pray, and we're so thankful for them. Lord, as you add them to your house, bricks in your building, these are people whom you love. I pray, Lord, that you would give them assurance and peace. Right where you are sitting, just say, Lord, I give you my life. I surrender my life. I admit I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I trust Jesus. Tell him that. I trust Jesus who died for me and rose again. I turn from my sin. I turn to Jesus as my Savior. I want to follow him as my Lord. Help me to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. We're going to close in a song. I saw a few different hands go up. If you would be so kind afterwards as to meet one of our decision team members or our pastors, they all have little badges on. Um, they don't look, look like holier than anybody else, so, so don't expect that. To, you'll never see a glow on anybody's faces. Uh, right, Caden, you have a glow? You don't have a glow. Kind of, you kind of have a glow, but you just need a little sun, that's all. Um, <laughs> So anyway, just, just make yourself known and just say, I, I prayed that prayer. We want to put something in your hand and welcome you into God's family. We hope you enjoyed this special service from Calvary Church. We'd love to know how this message impacted you. Email us at mystory@calvarynm.church. And just a reminder, you can support this ministry with a financial gift at calvarynm.church. Thank you for joining us for this teaching from Calvary Church.